Um, I'm going to be talking about some work called Smart Reply, which is a feature for an email application that automatically suggests responses. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to mention that this work was a collaboration between people in Google Research and Gmail. Um, and there's many people who contributed, as, as listed here. And in particular, I just wanted to mention that the first four authors all made equal contributions. OK. So Smart Reply, as I mentioned, is a feature for an email application. The goal of it is to help you, the user, compose responses to emails that you receive on a mobile device. The motivation for this is best understood by looking at an example. So you, you may not be able to read this, this screenshot here, but the email says, hi, all. We wanted to invite you to join us for an early Thanksgiving on November 22nd, beginning around 2 PM. Please bring your favorite dish and RSVP. Now, even though you didn't receive that email yourself, you could probably make some pretty good guesses about plausible responses. Maybe you don't know exactly what the recipient responded, but you could probably guess. Maybe they said, sure, I'll be there, I'd love to, or sorry, I can't make it this time. And so the idea for Smart Reply came when some Gmail engineers made this observation that even if you're not the recipient of the email, there's enough information just in the text of the email to come up with some plausible responses. And why would we want to do this? This feature is really targeted at the mobile scenario, where typing is kind of annoying and frustrating, and maybe you only have one hand. And being able to just tap on a response and send it could, be, could save you a lot of time and allow you to respond to emails um, you know, more quickly. So at a high level, what this system needs to do seems very simple. It just needs to take an incoming email and then produce an outgoing email. But if you break it down, there's actually a lot of things that have to happen under the hood, kind of a lot of little subtasks this system needs to accomplish in order to serve what seems like a very simple goal. And I've just listed some of them here. You know, it needs to have some notion of understanding of the original email. It needs to then understand the kind of relationship between an email and its response and generate a response, think about things like style and tone. Um, but stepping back a moment from these kind of like very specific tasks, if you think about it, we're basically trying to build a system that can, um, if, it, if it needs to predict a response in an email conversation, we're essentially saying that we need something that can participate in an email conversation at a human level. And if you think about it, you know, having a conversational agent that can participate in a believable human level, this is an open problem in language understanding. And so that's what made implementing this feature so challenging. So um, first, I'm going to go through uh, a little bit about the core model, the machine learning model that's part of this feature. Um, and then I'm going to step back and talk about some challenges that we encountered when we try to take this model and put it into production and how we dealt with some of those challenges. So at its core, um, the, the model in this feature is a sequence to sequence model. Um, since this is the deep learning session, maybe many of you are familiar with sequence to sequence, but I'll just quickly review it. Um, sequence to sequence was first proposed in the context of machine translation. And the idea is that you have two recurrent neural networks. One is the encoder and one is the decoder. Um, the encoder, in our case, is going to ingest the incoming message or encode it. And the decoder is going to generate the reply message or decode it. Again, both of these are recurrent neural networks. Um, and specifically, in this case, they're going to be LSTMs. So just to quickly review recurrent neural networks, um, a recurrent neural network is like a feed-forward neural network, except that it has an internal state that can persist across time as it reads a sequence of inputs. Okay? So in our case, uh, our sequence of inputs is just an email. That's a sequence of words. So let's say the email was something very simple, like, how are you? Basically, we just feed one token at a time into this recurrent neural network. At each step, it's, in, it's updating its internal hidden state. And by the time it's seen the last token, its internal state you can think of as a fixed dimensional vector representation of the message. It's an encoding of the message. And so this is exactly what our encoder is. The decoder is kind of the opposite. Instead of seeing these words one at a time and then ending up with an encoding, it now takes that encoding as its initial state. It's initialized with the um, vector, the hidden state from the encoder. And then it's going to output words one at a time. It's generating the reply. And if, if you're wondering how do we output a word, what we actually have is a softmax output. So we're actually outputting a distribution over words. We're outputting a probability assigned to each word in the vocabulary. So in this case, if the incoming email is something like, how are you, then the first output from the decoder is going to be 
a probability distribution over words in the vocabulary for the first word of the reply. So maybe that would be something like, you know, 0.5 for the word I, 0.25 for the word the, and 0.25 for the word what, something like that. And then again, since the decoder is also a recurrent neural network, we can do this repeatedly. We can keep feeding in words and keep getting a distribution over the vocabulary. So uh, putting that all together, the smart reply model looks like this. We have our encoder reads the tokens of the incoming email one at a time. Then the encoding that results from that is used to initialize the decoder. And then that outputs words one at a time. And again, it's actually outputting a distribution. This model is trained end to end on a corpus of email reply pairs. Um, both the encoder and decoder are trained together. And uh, one detail not mentioned here that I wanted to reiterate was that these recurrent neural networks in practice are LSTMs. Um, and then at inference time, the resulting model is fully generative. We can use that output distribution, the distribution over responses. We can uh, use that in a variety of ways. Essentially, we just want to get like the uh, the maximum likelihood, um, like the, arg the argmax over the distribution. And so we can use something like a beam search to do that. OK, so um, before I move on, I just wanted to show a, a quick example of kind of, you know, if this seems kind of abstract, what this looks like in practice. Um, in practice, we could just take an email, and I've just provided a, an example on the le in the left box. Um, the email says, hi, I thought it would be great for us to sit down and chat. I'm free Tuesday and Wednesday. Can you do the other days? Thanks, Alice. And what we would do is we would just feed this into the model exactly as is. There's really no pre-processing. Um, there's, there's no um, you know, pause tagging or anything like that. And you can see there's even actually a spelling mistake in it. And the um, top generated responses from the decoder using a beam search are shown on the right. And those are things like, I can do Tuesday, I can do Wednesday, how about Tuesday, and that sort of thing. So this is, just, this is just one simple example, but what this is meant to demonstrate is that after we trained this model, we found that um, in a variety of common email scenarios, it could in fact generate plausible responses, and it, and it seemed like uh, implementing this feature would in fact be doable. However, actually taking that model and deploying it into a system into a product that would potentially be exposed to millions of users raised several additional challenges. Um, for due to time constraints, I'm going to just I'm going to mention four challenges, but I'm only going to go in depth on one. So three of them, I'm just going to kind of mention them and give the solution at a high level. But there's more details in the paper, and then the last one I'll go a little bit more in depth in. So the first one is stepping back a little bit. How do we even know when we should show these suggestions? If you think about your email, there's probably a lot of cases you can think of where you just wouldn't even use suggestions. I mean, there's things you wouldn't reply to at all, like receipts and promotional emails and you know information disseminated to a large number of people. There's also things that you might reply to, but you would need to write a longer response at your desktop. You're not going to be able to use a short response um, on your phone. And we don't want to show suggestions when there's you know no chance they'll be used, because then they just become a little distracting. So um, without going too much in depth on this, our, our high level solution is that we actually have a separate component, a, a feed forward neural network that we first run to decide whether or not we're going to even visit the um, LSTM model that I already mentioned. A second challenge we encountered is quality. How do we ensure that the responses we're showing are always high quality? And when I talk about quality here, I'm now talking about irrespective of the original message. So I'm just saying if you looked at the responses on their own, how do we make sure that these are, are things that are OK to put into a product? So I've put some examples of things we'd want to avoid. Anything with spelling mistakes, punctuation mistakes, anything grammatically incorrect, um, anything with slang or, or that kind of thing. Even things that you know are perfectly plausible and people might want to say, like leave me alone, you know, just sounds a little bit rude, and so we probably wouldn't want to surface that. And one thing I want to emphasize is that if you look at these examples, you can see that restricting the model vocabulary would not solve this problem. Leave me alone, we actually want all those words in our vocabulary. Um, we just don't want that as a whole. So our solution here, again, just talking at a very high level, is that we actually have a fixed set of valid responses. And rather than allowing the model to um, generate unconstrained, we're going to restrict it to this set of valid responses. 
These responses are derived automatically from the data, um, and they, they basically act like a whitelist um, on what we can show. So then the problem is really more like finding the best response from the whitelist than just generating unconstrained. This leads to the next challenge I wanted to mention, which is scalability. Now if we're talking about finding the best response from a whitelist, the kind of naive thought would be to score everything in the whitelist and find the best scoring element. However, this would be very costly. It would also make your scoring process dependent on the size of the whitelist, which you know the whitelist is something that we want to be kind of as large as possible so that we can you know, allow the feature to be very expressive. So um, our very high level solution here is that instead of exhaustively scoring, we do an approximate search over the set of valid responses. And there's a lot more details about that in the paper, or you can ask me about it afterward. OK, the last challenge, which I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, is diversity. So first, to understand why we even care about diversity, um, I've put an example here. Let's say you receive this email, can you join tomorrow's meeting? If we just fed that to the model, the top responses would be, yes, I'll be there, yes, I will be there, and I'll be there. This is not quite what we want to show to users because we want to allow them, we kind of want to cover as many possible scenarios as possible. If you don't want to say, yes, I'll be there, you probably don't want to say, yes, I will be there. In order to make this useful, we want to cover different scenarios, so we need the responses to be not redundant. But you can see why all of these are kind of um, highly rated together, because if the model assigns high probability to yes, I'll be there, it's necessarily also going to assign high probability to yes, I will be there, because those are almost exactly the same, and, and it has you know, learned some smoothness across responses. <clears throat> What we really want to show is something like on the right, where we actually have, you know, sure, I'll be there, sorry, I won't be able to make it, and we're actually addressing different scenarios. However, to do this, we need to understand something about the semantic intent of the responses. We need to know when two responses are expressing the same intent and when they're not. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on explaining how we do this. Basically, what we want to do is we want to have some way to learn the semantic intent of every response. Then when it comes to, then, when it comes to um, enforcing diversity, we can actually use a very simple heuristic, which is just say, never show two suggestions with the same semantic intent, right? But how do we figure out those intents? What we want is something that looks like this, which I'm calling a structured semantic space, or you can think of it as semantic clusters. As you can see, um, th this is just a sample of candidates from our uh, valid responses, and they're organized according to their meaning or their intent. And what I want to stress is that, you know, if you look at the first cluster that says all set, there's things like all good here and everything is all set. And those don't actually share a lot of words. They also have different styles. One is much more enthusiastic than the other. But they have the same intent, and so they're put in the same cluster. And so this is like really ideally what we want to, what we want to learn. We do this using uh, the expander graph propagation framework. First, we start with a graph um, where nodes represent common or frequent sentences from our corpus, and the edge relationship um, means that two sentences co-occurred, one in an original message and one in a reply. So this is probably easiest to understand just by looking at this example. As you can see, how about Friday? is connected to when should we meet, because how about Friday is a plausible response to when should we meet, and it has occurred in a response to when should we meet. Then we manually assign some of the nodes to uh, seed clusters. So for example, the green node at the bottom, how about today, is assigned to this how about time cluster. Then through the graph propagation um, from Expander, we can learn the labels of the unlabeled nodes. So as you can see, how about Friday is now also assigned to the how about time cluster because it is a response to a message whose response was in the how about time cluster. <clears throat> so just to come back to what the goal of this whole um, algorithm is, is that at the end of the day we have these clusters and the clusters represent semantic intents. Now, coming back to the problem I mentioned before about diversity and eliminating redundancy, now it's going to be much easier because now we know what clusters each of these um, responses 
belong to. And just in case you can't uh, read this, the um, message says, we're waiting for you. Are you going to be here soon? And we have on my way, on my way, I'm here, I'm on my way. Now that we know what clusters these belong to, which are uh, represented by the different colors, blue, red, and green, now it's very easy to eliminate redundancy. We basically say we're only ever going to show one response per cluster. So we found diversity to be useful um, both in terms of addressing the subjective user feedback on the feature, but also more quantitatively, when we did an online experiment that removed diversity, we found that click-through rate went down by 7.5% relative. So we believe this is an important aspect of the feature. Um, OK, with my last few minutes, I'll uh, go into a few more results. So uh, probably the most important result of this work is that this feature is now deployed in Inbox by Gmail. And it's used to assist with more than 10% of all mobile replies. Uh, a common question I get is, well, are you just, is it just the case that you know, so many emails could be responded to with, you know, sounds good or thank you? And you're just suggesting sounds good and thank you to all of the emails? So that's actually not the case. Um, what this chart shows, the uh, table on the top, is that on an average day, we see 13,000 unique suggestions used over 376 different clusters. And those clusters, again, represent meanings or intents. Uh, the graph at the bottom is, is just showing the frequency of response usage for the top 500 responses. And you can see that um, this, this ends up having a relatively long tail. So it's, it's not the case that there's just uh, two, two clusters or two responses that, that everyone is using or that we're always showing. Um, another common question is, you know, what sorts of scenarios is this useful in? Um, as you can see, you know, the thanks cluster is the most popular cluster, which is that long bar at the bottom. Um, but there's actually a lot of other um, clusters that also get used, and these kind of represent different scenarios. Things like, no, I didn't. Um, Here you go, love it, looks good. Um, I'll be there, that kind of thing. And this is just the top 20 clusters. This is, of course, not all of the clusters. OK, uh, getting into some more uh, results that are more specific to the LSTM model that I mentioned in the first half of the talk. Um, in, in this experiment, what we did is we look at the, um, the uh, uh, ability of the LSTM model to correctly um, rank the candidate responses with respect to a particular original message. So what we've done here is we've taken real emails whose response was on the whitelist and then ranked all of the whitelist responses using the LSTM model with respect to that original email. And then we look for the rank of the true response in that ranking. And so what this is showing is that the, um, our LSTM model, 48% uh, of the time, excuse me, 48% of the time, the true response was in the top 10. And um, the reason we look at the top 10 here, not something like the top one, is that usually there's actually many different possible correct responses to an email. You know, if, if no problem was a good response, then, you know, that's fine, you know, may also be a correct response. Or, you know, if sounds good was a correct response, sounds great probably also is. So um, yes, in this case, 48% of the time was in the top 10, 58% of the time was in the top 20. And um, you can see that that uh, does better than all the baselines we've described here. I'm running out of time, so I won't describe the baselines. But that is described more in the paper. Um, a few quick examples. Here's an email that says, did you manage to update the screenshot on the front of the page? We need to send the paper tonight. Hope we can make it in time for KDD. And the responses are, yes, it's done, working on it now. No, I haven't yet. So you can see they kind of cover a range of scenarios. And so just to quickly wrap up, I think I'm out of time. I just wanted to reiterate that the sequence to sequence model produces plausible email replies in many common uh, scenarios when it's trained on an email corpus. We've now deployed Smart Reply in Inbox by Gmail. And it's assisting in more than 10% of mobile replies. And just stepping back a little bit and going beyond this feature, I just wanted to mention that, I, that we also think that this work shows that recurrent neural networks um, show promise not just for this, this type of application where you have assisted communication, but really other applications that require a conversation model um, like virtual assistants.
That's it. Hi. I was wondering uh, if you did consider pre-training on a generic set of uh, responses and then uh, doing some training on the last layer for based on uh, cultural diversity or for even for that particular person um, so that it can be more, uh, like from an HCI perspective, it can be more personal rather than being more uh, generic? Uh, yeah, that, uh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, uh, for people who didn't hear, he was basically asking, um, you know, right now we have one global model and that's what everybody sees. Have we thought about training it to be um, more personal in various ways, whether that's, you know, uh, different cultures' use of the same language or different languages or, or different people's, um, you know, tone and style? Um, that's not something we currently do. It is just one global model. Um, but I think that is a big opportunity um, yeah, w one thing that we have noticed, you know, if we even just look at the uh, white list of responses that's automatically generated from the data, is that we can see that, you know, you're asking about cultural diversity, we can see um, many different cultures' use of English represented in there. And right now, we don't do a good job of deciding, you know, when to show, well, we're, we're not specifically training for, um, you know, who uses uh, culturally specific phrases or not. Um, but I think that is a big opportunity. Yeah, and people might respond differently to people of different culture as well. Like when I'm responding to someone from India uh, as while well, responding to someone from the US, for example. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So just uh, sort of intuitively looking at the previous talk and this one, you used an explicit clustering mechanism to cluster for diversity. Did you think or did you try or uh, using the hidden layer activations uh, in the LSTM? Would that also work or? Um, yeah, I think that's a very good, that's a very good suggestion. Um, yeah, in, in this work as it's presented here, we, we do kind of use this separate system for clustering. Um, I think other work has shown that the LSTM hidden layer um, can be useful for just representing a sentence or a message. Um, so I, I think that's a, a good suggestion. Okay. But you didn't actually try it and reject it. That's what, I'm t that's what I was taking. <laughs> no. Yeah, um, I was at planning to ask the same question. When you do BIM search, you basically, if you answer yes or no, basically you're going to different state, basically. If you can somehow decipher there and then kind of you can do diversification at that decoding stage. That's kind of thinking. I'm not sure I understood the question. Oh. So you're saying when you're doing the beam search in post-diversity there. Beam search, right? Along the same line yeah. that this gentleman was asking. You're, for example, you answer yes or no. You probably is already diverting into different oh, trend yeah. uh, messages you have learned before. Mm -hmm. And then if you do that and s figure a way to do that uh, during the beam search, maybe that can help your diversification. Yeah, so you're saying use some notion of distance between the hidden states right. of the decoder now. The decoder, so as we're so doing the beam search. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I can see how that would be worth experimenting with. Um, yeah, it would be tricky because you also want to kind of like respect the fact that the beam search is, you know, showing you the, the best. Right, um, right. You know, you well, don't I mean, like just if the top couple of uh, responses, if they are closer to each other, you don't really need to. Yeah, that's Keep true. All right, thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot. I'm sorry I have to cut it off. We have to go to the next paper. Please come here after the end of the talks. Thanks a lot. Let's thank the speaker again.